as someone who's closed restaurants that have failed, it's a lot of money when you're when you're paying into a restaurant and a restaurant's not paying you. And and I've been there. Look, I'm not coming to you because I because because I've done it right every single time. I'm talking to you from some of the mistakes that I made too. What's going on, Pizza King Podcast listeners? I'm back at it with you. It's your host, Tyrell T. Big T, they call me. First of all, if you if you didn't get a chance to listen to last week's episode with Mike Bausch, go check that out because it was jam-packed with a bunch of just a bunch of good information, um, a lot of insights into what it takes to just, you know, become that that multi-unit super super power, powerhouse pizza empire like what he's built out in Tulsa, he gave, he gave some practical insights and also, you know, make sure you just go check out some of the products that he's got with, if it's even getting a free book with Unslice or, you know, joining a mail list or signing up for, for his course and coaching program, all, all very beneficial for anyone looking to grow, you grow that business. So out of, out of that, I, you know, I thought it'd be important to talk through you know, just some different scenarios when it comes to getting into the pizza business. Obviously, there's a lot of different routes and a lot of different paths to get to to get to an open restaurant. But I wanted to talk about one one specifically, which is, you know, very common and also very risky. If um, if you don't know what you're doing, if you don't have a you don't have a plan, which is through the acquisition model. So for those that don't know, there are lots of restaurants that open every single year and the unfortunate side of what we do is that not every one of those situations works out right uh, for whatever reason if it's it could be money it could be bad location it could be poor management and operations it could be you know someone just decided that it just wasn't the right the right thing to do it was too much work there's a lot of different reasons that it doesn't work out but what happens is that that creates opportunity. And if you're somebody like me, even beyond the acquisition model, if you're looking, if you're like me and you're looking for a new, a new unit to get into or a new situation, a lot of times we start by trying to find like second gen or, or, you know, you know, fair value acquisitions to lower our cost of entry. Right. So that becomes very popular. But I mean, listen, we all, maybe we don't all know, but there's some, re- there are restaurant sharks out there waiting on opportunities to scoop these things up um, because you get them, you get them for way less than what it would cost to build out a new store or to buy something that's profitable. So failing businesses sell to whether it's, you know, finding a way to take over. And there's a lot of different ways to get into that. And I won't go into that in this episode, but I think maybe we'll come back and kind of break down the acquisition process um, because there are different, there are different ways to take over a restaurant too. So, but for today, I just wanted to talk about what it looks like after you get into that situation. Like what, what are your goals? What do you, what do I focus on first? How would I turn around a failing restaurant if that's what I found myself getting into? If I were taking over something that was cheap, you know, you know, 30, 40, 50,000 or whatever, whatever it costs. Like if I was going to do something like that and it was a failing situation, what what would I do or what would I focus on? To turn that situation around. And that's what I wanted to talk about here today, because that those opportunities actually Once you've proven yourself to be a reputable operator, you know, a good person in the community, you know, a a celebrated business leader, these opportunities start to find you. Like people think of you when when things pop up, because like I said before, it's the unfortunate side of it, but they do. These things do pop up and they do happen quite frequently. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you. You know, I, I work I work franchise leads and I'm in the franchise sales side of things, too. And there are opportunities almost every single day, almost every single day. So but it also takes the right person with the right plan to make sure that you turn those into profitable situations, because 
just because something cheap doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. Oftentimes it means it's the, the, the actually the opposite. The, the cheaper it is, the, the higher the hill to climb, right? The longer the road is to, to profitability. So what would I do when I'm in those situations? If I, you know, there's just a few main key things that I'm, that I'm really trying to focus on when I, if I say, if we, let me back up, for example, if we, we're, we're deciding we're going to take over a store and, you know, you got a closing date and you, and you do, you get all these things. After you've gone through the due diligence and you, you, you've got your, you know, all your accounts set up and your vendors and all these things, it, it comes time to really start putting the work in on writing the ship, right? So I like to focus on five things when it comes to turning around the operations of a place, especially if you, if, if the goal is to turn it around quickly, I'm going on five key areas. And this is how we write a ship in a, in a failing restaurant. And look in this, this even applies to a store. That's not something that we take over, but if it's, if I'm in a situation where someone reaches out to me and they want some assistance or they want me to coach them on just getting it straight, right? Just getting it together. It's a, I'm going to follow the same processes here because chances are the same things that are the same elements that are causing one restaurant to fail are probably some of the same things that we're going to see in most, in most other situations. So five things and I'll, and I'll run them down and we'll, we'll kind of just talk through each one of them. But first thing I'm going to focus on is food safety. Second, I'm going to focus on cash processes. Like what, what are we doing with the money? Third, we're talking about inventory and food costs. Fourth, we're going to talk about management routines. And last, we're going to talk through communication. And I think it's important to, to note when, when I say these are the things, and I'm, I'm 100% talking about these are the things that we're going to work on as a leadership team, meaning owner, general manager, assistant general manager, shift leads, trainers like who are the who are the leaders in this situation because these are the people that we want to correct behaviors in first and then roll things out to to the rest of the team but we all we i always prefer to start with taking care of the leadership portion first because these are the people who are really doing doing heavy lifting you know in in it in the situation every single day and if we can correct their behaviors we can start to set the precedent for thriving, profitable situation later, right? Because that's the goal. We don't want to, we want to, we don't want to continue to have to dump money into, into a failing restaurant. And and as someone who's closed restaurants that have failed, it's a lot of money when you're when you're paying into a restaurant and the restaurant's not paying you. And and I've been there. Look, I'm not coming to you because I because because I've done it right every single time. I'm talking to you from some of the mistakes that I made too. So trust me when I tell you, it gets real expensive. If you don't correct some of the things that are, that are really driving your restaurant down. But the first one is food safety. And I think this, this is first on, on my list. when it comes to, to coaching, to teaching, food safety has got to be number one. It's our, it's our top priority as operators to provide a safe experience for our customers, not just from a food, from a cleanliness standpoint, but are we choosing the right vendors? Are we handling the food the right way? Are we teaching our team to handle the food the right way? Like not just checking the boxes, meaning we got serve, serve safe and, you know, we, we did, like, you know, we got our, our, our labels. No, or do we really have the right processes in place to maintain a, a, a high quality, clean, safe, sanitized environment? And this is an everyday practice. This is something that can never and should never be looked over. Food safety is our number one, our number one responsibility, and our number one priority when it comes to serving our guests. Like they give us our, they give us their hard earned money because they trust that we're doing the right things behind the door, behind the curtain, behind the kitchen wall to ensure that they're getting the best quality or the highest quality product. You know what I mean? So food safety is number one. And, and it's, and it's, Usually it's covering the basics. Do we have do we have a process for labeling all of our prep and all of our product? Do we have a process for 
how we receive, receive, store, prepare, and distribute food product, right? So there's a there's a process for each one of those. Do we have good hand washing practices? Do we have temperature checking and equip do you know is our equipment working properly so like, properly? So taking the time to really address that with your leadership team and, and from the beginning, making it the highest priority because look, and these things are, are set up to build on each other, you know, week by week. So, so are we set up to prop, you know, to, to really say that we're, we're operating in the safest possible environment. And that's an important one. So we spend a lot of time just addressing food safety concerns taking care of that and, and building in good habits and good practices. Second, we're going to talk about, you know, second, I'm, a, I'm always going to go towards, you know, the cash processes. Like that's, to me, that's like the next, next most important thing is, all right, so we know the food is good. We know, we, you know, you know, no one's at any risk from, from ordering from this place. Where the money at? How does the money flow? Like where, how are we handling cash deposits? You know, how long do credit card deposits take? Where, how are we tracking these things? Like, so that we don't ensure, so that we don't let things slip through the cracks, because I promise you, and this isn't, this isn't a knock on any person or anything, but if there is no, if there's no regard to where the cash is and how the cash is handled, then I promise you, you probably, you're missing some of it. So cash handling processes, deposits, where, how are we making drops? Do we have a safe? Who has access to the safe? Who's taking cash deposits to the bank? How are we verifying those deposits? All these things have to, have to be documented and systemized so that every single person understands what their role is in that. So, you know, the last thing you want is for, for cash or for, and, and not that cash is a huge deal in our business anymore. A lot of things get a lot of transactions are, you know, credit card and tap and all these other things online, online transactions. However, we still need to know, you know, there's there's still the potential for a variance if things aren't being properly monitored and checked. So um, having a process for that a day and this is a daily process, just like food safety, daily process, daily process where we're checking, we're checking that cash every day, every, you know, if you if it's a situation where you're you're in a, a high volume situation. This may be, you may be dropping deposits twice a day, depending on how, how your shifts work. So working out our cash processes is going to be, you know, the next most important thing on my list. Then once we, and, and again, remember, we're working with leadership team on these things so they can, and they can implement and, you know, implement, enforce, react, like whatever, whatever they got to do, just making sure that the leadership team understands the processes. Then there's the inventory and, and food, you know, inventory food cost processes. Like what do the accounts look like? And I know there's, you know, there's some folks that don't believe in, you know, counting inventory. We're just, you know, we just know, we know what our food spend is. And if it gets out of whack and we know we're starting to have a problem, but as your volume starts to grow and that's, and I think that's fine up to a certain level, but as your volume starts to increase, you're going to, you're going to want to need, you, you need to understand your food variance because it, a, a small variance could mean big dollars depending on the item. You know, if you're, if you're, if your cheese is out 2% every day, that adds up to, a, and I mean, that adds up to a ton of money at the end of the week and at the end of the year. Like why is, you know, why are we, you know, where's the cheese going? Are we, it, it just indicates something going on. Is there, a, is there, you know, something wrong with our portioning? Is there something going on in the process? Are we seeing product go out the door? Like, so having a process for inventory, for counts, some, you know, there's critical counts, there's daily counts. If we're talking like in pizza, a lot of folks like to count boxes, count cheese, you know, on a, on a daily, that gives you just a, just a quick and dirty estimate on, you know, what went out versus what, what was sold versus what went out. And that's where we start to see gaps and it's, and it's all, this becomes more of a loss prevention type deal, right? So we, we prevent any potential for, for theft or, I mean, let's just, let's just call it, it's, it's just theft. Even if it's not, 
with the thought of being, you know, you know, I'm stealing this. It's still theft if they're giving food away or whatever, you know, it just, it just is what it is. So having a process for that allows you to have deeper insights into, you know, where your potential gaps are. So having, having a system that helps you understand actual versus your theoretical uses every single day or every week, understanding what that variance means, understanding what your, what your tolerance is for, you know, the variance on particular items and overall variance, you know, it may not be a big deal to be out, you know, half a percent on, on a certain topping. If we know that, you know, we, we, we're okay with putting a little extra on, or we know that some of these things start, you know, have a, you know, highly, you know, perishable and go back quickly. We need to know. So, and then understanding what our waste looks like, having a waste look, having a waste like these are processes that can be that turn into the system. So having an inventory process and a system for, for managing your food helps you, helps you run a successful and profitable business later on. So as we, then as we move on from, from inventory processes, we go into management routines. Like what are those daily and weekly routines look like from a leadership standpoint? What day of the week are we writing schedules? What day do we do inventory? What, who's, you know, what days do we have team meetings? What, what days are we like just having routines to make your life easier? Because as a restaurant leader, there's usually a lot of things swirling around you and you got a lot going on at any particular time. So having some balance and having some, you know, having some things systemized, having some routines in place helps control a little bit of the chaos because once you get into it and once we get into our peak times, lunch rush, dinner rush, you're not, you're not a, you're not the same manager. You're some, you're, you are, you know, an, an important person in a function in those oftentimes, in, you know, in a function in, in those times and during those situations. So you need to manage your time, your off peak times as effect, as efficiently as you possibly can. And to me, that's through routine. So routines help keep leadership on track, which in turn helps keep the rest of the team on track and focus on whatever those daily and weekly tasks are. Um, so I, I always try to, you know, put together a, just a, you know, just a, an outline of what the what the expectations are on a daily and weekly basis. And then we start to tailor what the routines and the schedule looks like beyond that. So, you know, sometimes there's some non-negotiables and then sometimes there's some things that are just flexible. But it helps to build in consistency, which just helps with a whole bunch of shit later on. So being consistent is gonna is gonna help you no matter what. If you're consistently on point, if you're consistently bad, is you know your shit's just gonna be off. And then the last thing that we talk through is communication. Like what do what do our communication processes look like? Because at the end of the day, like I always say, communication. My dog ran out. Communication just can't fail. Like people who need to get information need to get the information. So whether it's making sure that you have daily huddles, you know, for each shift or, you know, you're you're highlighting what needs to be done on, you know, the charts and checklists around the store or you got, you know, digital checklists or something like that. Or, you know, you got email and text things that go out. Having a good communication plan and a system for how each person gets the messages that they need to receive is going to be another important piece of that. So th those are the five things. Remember, food safety, cash processes, inventory processes, management routines and communication processes. Those are the things that I'm going to focus on when it comes to turning around a bad situation or a, not, a, a business that's losing money or in an acquisition or a transition situation. We're going to focus on those to make sure that our leadership team is on point and ready for whatever comes next, which means retraining the staff or even bringing in new people, you're going to you're going to know that the people who are in charge, your leadership team is on point because you address the major key items in that situation. So that's all I got. Holler at your boy.